I wanted to start with um, the kind of topic of why we're all here to talk about books and, and how bookmaking has been quite important in your art practice. These are examples of early books that I hear you made kind of yourself and, and kind of had your hand in, in that. So I want to start there really kind of what, yeah. What the, what what what, what, what the important, yeah, well, well, kind of like the importance of bookmaking in your art practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, you know, I, bu I buy books and I, I collect them and I, I make them. So it's quite hard to, you know, to unstick books from anything, really. Mm -hmm. um, but these, these are made on my sort of inkjet, inkjet printer at home. Um, they were kind of a loss-making exercise right from the beginning, you know, because I... They'd be individually printed, at, you know, in, in an inkjet printer at a time when, you know, an ink cartridge was like half of a student loan, you know, and um, and so and then I'd staple them and I'd I'd sell them for below cost, and they were, I think, made at a time when when these things were still unavailable, relatively out of print. Um, I would download them at a time <coughs> when the internet was starting to be slightly more widespread. Um, or more accessible, but there were these projects like Project Gutenberg, which were making lots of texts available, so I'd download these things and then type them into, the whole thing was just a bloody nightmare, and it would just go on for months and months and months, and then I'd end up with like 10 little copies, and I'd sell them for five quid. I mean, but it was all kind of self-flagellation. You know, that's what you're expected to do as an art student, is oh to really? sort of talk to yourself. Okay. Like yeah. So it was really just kind of, you were kind of following um, the expectation. Oops. Of, of, of art school at the time? Were you at the Slade at this time? Uh, no, I, I was at the Slade and, and then at Goldsmiths. I think I was more or less, or maybe I just graduated. Okay. And I was trying to make work that I could make in my bedroom. And right. the books were all about um, rarity, kind of very l controlled numbers, something that was going to be fragile. Most of these people were going to chuck them away because they only mm. paid three quid for them. Some mm -hmm. of them were going to survive and be cherished. I mean, I don't think they are, but, you know. There are one or two people that have them in collections, and yeah. they've somehow survived. And you know. Okay. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank but they're, they're very boring books, actually. They're just literally just the text that now you can download for free, and you know whatever. Yeah. No one would ever print them because it costs more than to just you know click and buy a sort of print-on-demand book. Well, one thing. I mean, we'll we'll kind of come back to this, I think. But one thing I noticed. Um, yeah, I mean, all your books really they're they're quite ephemeral. They're about a moment, right? Uh, in time, and you're kind of capturing something. So this book um, was a very a kind of one of your major works published in 2007. Um, probably it, it, it was so successful it was <laughs> reprinted in 2011 again. So I just wondered if you could really talk talk to us about the intention behind this and um, why you think it was yeah. so successful as well. Uh, I think um, it sold quite a lot because it was perceived as being like really filthy pornography at the time. Um, I mean, we're talking about no publications having been really produced about postmodern London since Charles Jenks's last publications about it in sort of 1990 or so. Um, and so this was, uh, I, I used Jenks's text as a sort of foundation for this work. Um, but, um, th you know, fashion architecture taste for making work about it, but if not, I mean, it was really derided stuff. I mean, people would sort of look at the good stuff, but really the whole point of POMO is that it's neither good nor bad. Mm. It's both, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And there's no real... I mean, why why bother differentiating a good bit of sterling from a really bad Michael Grape? You know, mm. it's just pointless. The whole thing is a commentary on interchangeability and flip-on and, you know, ephemeral image-making. I mean, whether it's good or bad is, you know... And why, why, what, what was the focus? Why focus just on London with this? Uh, well, uh, um, a bit because it was to do with a tour I did, um, and it was about walking around and seeing these buildings. So it was basically a kind of guide. It would just tell you where these things were, um, what they looked like, and how to identify them, and a little brief description. It was kind of bitchy, you know, fascist camp, you know, it was what it yeah. was. Yes, classic you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so next, next slide. Um, so yeah, that was kind of very focused on London, and then you produced this book 
um, about in about Turin or a building in Turin's particular this particular building it's in which yeah. yeah to me it's like very like it's almost like a Pablo Bronstein <laughs> building. <laughs> it, it's yeah. a very very crazy Antonelli building yeah. which is about fifteen meters fifteen centimeters thin on one side. It's a triangle, very very odd. I think one of the first uses of I can't. It's it's got some crazy importance in architecture. I mean, I mm. didn't do it justice. I kind of made a book about the moment this building becomes a commercial gallery. So the sort of point at which um, it moves from having a Mon Renzo Mongiardino interior to essentially being whitewashed and having mm. everything neutralized in order to start taking contemporary art in. You know. and, and how did you find it? Why did you decide? Like, why was it so important? You needed to like make a book. Oh, it, my gallery owned the building. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so there so they, were, they were like, yeah. you know, we wanted okay. to make a project. Herald and, and the book sort of, no, no, yeah, Franklin Rowe, the, the okay, Turinese yeah, gallery. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, you know, galleries love, you know, that. Publish. Keep yeah. people, you know, talking about them. And, and then, so this process, I guess, of like um, finding interest and specifically, and maybe you can go to the next slide. Um, uh, yeah, I just wondered, like, where, how, how do you decide that books are the kind of way of capturing that interest of the time? And how does your own, this is a, a picture of your own book collection, or some of your books in your collection, um, and how do those kind of play in your references and series of references? And when you're thinking about how to put a book together, what is on the front cover, you know? I mean, most of my books are, are plate books. The ones I collect tend to be plate books, um, right. the historical ones at mm. least, are, are ones. Um, a uh, a, a plate book in, in um, the history of interior decoration or, or object making is, is a kind of guide to a series of patterns that you can essentially sort of choose um, which one you like and then have your silver maid or craftsman can sort of see how to do a proper leg on a particular sort of chair and then this sort of image um, gets sort of more and more and more bastardized as the original picture book then gets translated and recopied and so on and so forth. Very often these books are sort of um, nailed up onto the walls of um, carpentry workshops and so on. Um, and one or two of my books even have the uh, old hanging hooks where they were literally just hung up um, mm. and either worked from or sometimes torn off, you know. Um, so I collect those and, and, I, and the books that I make tend to be about that. They're, just, they're pictures, they're a way also of, of you know, sequ sequencing my work, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I need control and I need to be told what to do by myself and if I say well now you have to make 50 drawings about keyhole designs then mm -hmm. they go in a book and I make 50 drawings you know but there's also this kind of um, weird residue of minimalism in all of this because a, a, a plate book is, is a kind of weird series of endless almost meaningless options on a given theme you can have a keyhole like this, or you can have it like this, or you can mm -hmm. have it like this. There's a kind of, mm, you know, mm -hmm. which I which That's I like, crazy. and ultimately it's just you you choose to limit it to fifty. You could go on and on and on. So you're really kind of documenting, and then I think maybe now would be a quite good time to talk about that. You know, these these are the books that you collect, and they the sort of, I guess, permanence to um, how they're made and uh, what they look like. And it's but you know going back to like your earlier work, the, the kind of ephemeral quality of those and the fact that you're really kind of documenting a moment, is that, are you conscious of that? Is that something you're kind of do, thinking about that this is a, um, an object, a kind of piece of the moment that might not kind of go, you know, I mean, um, last forever? I, I, if, if I'm honest, I'm such an artist, I don't think anything I do is just for the moment. Do you know what right. I mean? I, yeah. I have this delusion that everything's going to be sort of Preserved <laughs> forever. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and you're going to have, you know, the Pablo Bronson Museum in yeah. 50 years' time, right? Yeah. Um, okay. What but about, like, the way, kind of the way the books are but made? The, the, the yeah. cheapness or the, well, I mean, you know, the, the, the reality of, of, of printing in the art world is that the, um, the publishers and the museums have to do it for as cheaply as mm -hmm. humanly possible. Uh, uh, and um, I, I've never been in a situation where someone has said, make a book cost is no object, it just mm -hmm. has to be gorgeous. I mean, mm. you do that if you're doing some shitty 
kind of bougie show in some Swiss private foundation and they don't care about visitor numbers and they don't care who buys okay. this book and, and then you can just go to town. But yeah. then that's also slightly humiliating. You know, there are horror stories about people spending fifty thousand pounds on books mm -hmm. and they only sell one or two copies. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and so cult. the, the exact yeah. it's horrible, you know. Yeah. And so <laughs> the the point of you know, working with a sort of large publisher I, I work with Walter Koenig, mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, uh, it is that these things actually just get shifted. Mm -hmm. um, I also work with Mark El Khatib, and Mark um, uh, had this sort of unenviable unen job of somehow taking these um, w little books that were sort of characteristically mine mm -hmm. and translating that aesthetic into something that you know, you can buy at the Whitechapel bookshop or something. Mm -hmm. um, but the um, the books that I was interested in when I started out were these really, really fey books by these sort of very campy, uh, anti-modern-y, Rex Wissery type people who mm -hmm. would sort of do these little etchings and these little book platey type things. And it was all really tweet, actually not very highbrow. I mean, these books were these kind of Batsford, Batsford books, the Saturday books, these kinds of books. And they were, they were quite you know, available, really. They weren't expensive. Um, and they were certainly not expensive when I was buying them. And the kind of rubbish that you would see at the kind of really bottom shelf of the second-hand bookshop, you know, really moth-eaten, horrible books, you know, that were just sort of, you know, Lawrence Whistler's views on Sicilian architecture illustrated by blah, blah. I mean, nonsense, you know. Um, and, and, and because that stuff was so uncool when I was looking at it also. I mean, uh, and, and I sort of had this sort of feeling of sadness for it. I kind of copied it all and, you know, and, and then, you know, Mark had to somehow, when things started to get more and more serious in mm -hmm. terms of book numbers, we had to sort of start to make it look like that, but available. I, I, I can't, I'm not going to sort of hand illustrate these things forever. No. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Mark, so graphic designer who, who you've worked with quite, quite a lot and if we go to the next, next slide. Um, actually, we might come back to this one, next slide after that, um, just, just before. Hmm? Yeah, no, um, actually, yeah, let's, let's start in the second slide maybe then. Yes, the Gilded, so um, I did, yeah, I, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about um, so you obviously started with kind of producing everything. You would illustrate the front covers, make them, et cetera, quite ephemeral. Then, then as things progressed um, and you started to collaborate with people like Marco Khatib and um, uh, you're, you've had this dedicated publisher co with Koenig Books, um, you also started to collaborate with other people in, in, in your book making. Like, can you tell us a little bit about that process? Like, How do you decide who it is that you would kind of work with um, that because, as you said, you know, kind of Mark's process of taking your aesthetic, your way of doing things, and kind of making something that represents you is kind of also becomes part of your practice and, and their their attachment to that. How do you bring people in? Um, do you mean how how do I bring people in in a kind of like who who writes the essays yes. that kind of yes, stuff? Yes, exactly. Um, I mean, to be honest, that stuff is always a kind of dialogue with the institution, mm -hmm. with, with, the, with the museum that's paying for the book or with, you know, the, a gallery if they're paying for it or, you know, all, all of that stuff is, is really quite sort of, in a way, it's quite boring. You know, mm -hmm. we're like, I mean, who, who knows more, you know, who knows more than me about architecture? Well, Sam Jacobs does, mm -hmm. so we'll get him to write one. And mm -hmm. who knows more than me about performance? Well, Catherine Wood does, so we'll mm -hmm. get her. I mean, it's all, it's quite, and between them, they kind of contextualise me in a way that, I find flattering, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then these two books, um, particularly, I want to talk about because so there are two books you made about ornament and decoration, and you're obviously very interested in those themes. Um, I guess like what draws you to those themes in particular, um, in relation to architecture? Um, yeah. Why? Why fixate on the keyhole? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, well, t to be honest, the Things like the doorways allowed for a little trick um, where there was always a kind of basic door size that would run through the book and mm. then there would be one 
doodle on top of that hole and another on top of the hole and another on top of the hole. And, and that one would be a bit more Shinrothery, that one would be a bit more Egyptian style, that one would be... Do you know what I mean? Like there was mm -hmm. different sort of histories and fantasies sort of stuck onto it. Mm -hmm. um, and the keyhole's the same. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. they're, they're sort of... They're, they're touching into a sort of history of, of you know, 18th, 17th, 18th and 19th century decorative arts where, where you could sort of applique your interior with whatever, you know, the fashions were in brassware or curtains or, you know, whatever, mm. you know. And that process of a kind of, once you have a, a theme, a thematic for the book, um, what's your process of, of kind of research of kind of, you know, how do you go through that to decide, okay, this is, you know, you're, you're kind of telling a story a lot of the time, you, you write a lot of text for these books, so, you know, what is that process? Well, I mean, there's a lot of role play mm -hmm. in there. I mean, I sort of have to pretend to be the designer. Mm -hmm. um, I am sort of designing it, but it's not as if people are actually going to cast that keyhole in yeah. brass, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, but so, so, although one guy got a tattoo of one of these things, oh, really? but that's well. sort of <laughs> slightly misapplied. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, but to be honest, the kind of um, uh, the, the, the role play is important and it forms kind of frequent aspect of my, my other bits of my practice, you mm -hmm. know. So um, you, y y you know, I, I pretend to be a designer, but then I, I very often will write the introduction or, you know, the explanatory texts alongside in the style of, you know, um, uh, a, a kind of uh, a, a pompous purveyor of brassware from 1900, you know, that kind of, you know, language my, I might use. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a bit of that that goes on. There's the usual research of, you know, just l looking at, at books. Um, I have to very often buy these things um, mm. because you can't get them out of libraries. And if you're just looking online at Pinterest or somewhere, within five seconds, you're looking at cats on skateboards. <laughs> Attention span, you mean, right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. and also there's yeah, not much. That's there's not much that's actually really uploaded, really. Yeah. No, you know, of course. In it's terms of, you know, so there's. I mean, uh, Europe produced, I mean, hundreds of thousands of pattern books mm -hmm. in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, endless variations, diamond earrings this way, that way, the other way, the other way. Mm -hmm. You know, like shoelace styles this way. <coughs> endless amounts of stuff. Uh, actually, the amount of stuff that has made it online is really quite poor, to be honest. Well, like you said, it's it's relatively niche. Um, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I guess. I guess. Maybe we, for the audience, we could talk a little bit about because you know you say you pretend to be a designer, and <coughs> and I think in other interviews, you've um, been in. You kind of talk about pretending to be an architect and kind of having to role play an architect. Um, but you know you you have been kind of producing architectural drawings for quite a long time, you also applied to, to architecture school. I mean, I did, I, I, yeah. I triumphed at the Bartlett for about <laughs> three weeks. <laughs> exactly, exactly, which is, you know, pretty pretty good going. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I guess certain regards, like, ha have kind of still made quite a successful um, career out of working architecture adjacent or within the realms of architecture. Was that always the intention? I mean, <coughs> the... I am very much an artist. I'm not mm. an architect. Um, and I don't really think like an architect because I don't have to... Um, I don't have to make anything good. Do you know what I mean? I mean, there work, is... Or work, a, rather, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. uh, there, there is a fundamental... I mean, you know, I, I know that there's, you know, a lot of really discursive projects that are all, you know, uh, unbelievably interesting and sophisticated, but ultimately architects are, are fundamentally interested in solving problems mm -hmm. in trying to figure stuff out mm -hmm. i mean th the the amount th the level that you can take horror in architecture deliberately is quite limited you know whereas in in art you can smear yourself in feces and beat someone up and yeah. call it call you know it yeah. practice yeah <laughs> great on um, that note next next slide please um, so yeah i guess um kind of keeping on the theme of, of kind of book making and being an important part of the art pra practice. This is from the C scenes, uh, let me got the name, studies in early scenography, sorry. And um, yeah. this is, um, this was a book that you made as an artwork, so limited edition book, um, 
kind of produce as an artwork, so you kind of very much are kind of taking that on as like publications can also be partially artworks. Um, yeah. And this, <coughs> in this collage, I mean, you, I think you took fragments from Renaissance paintings, was it Antoine, from Antoine Corot's Renaissance paintings, and you yeah. kind of re, um, pick, re, reconfigured them spatially. So you were you know, starting to kind of think about them spatially. This, for me, conjures up like Super Studios collages, for example. Like, was that a reference? Like, how do you reconcile? It, it seems very contemporary with this kind of 18th century Renaissance art. It was, it, it was a reference, <coughs> but um, the, the kind of, um, uh, I, I think the closest this artwork gets is to sort of spurious historical discourse, which is what this is, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, although the, the arguments were fairly, so, so basically Antoine Caron is this, uh, is this Mannerist French painter at a time when the French court was having a lot of sort of internal s instability and everything was sort of rather chaotic. And in the dying days of uh, 16th century court life in France, uh, when there was a lot of fight between different um, aristocratic factions, um, the royal family produced these rather insipid court ballets that they would dance in and other people would dance in that would glorify their reign. And there would be things like, you know, titles such as, you know, the triumph of Flora, and then so, you know, the the princess that was due to be married would be Flora, you know, and so on, and everyone mm -hmm. would be excited by her entrance and so on. Um, and so <coughs> these these ballets exist recorded in these paintings, which are very, very odd, really unsuccessful paintings in terms of the kind of heights of the Counter-Reformation that was going on in Italy. I and mean, they're very odd little figures that dot around and sit spatially rather awkwardly on tiled floors because they're actually representations of ballet. And, and so you, you very often see these pictures in art history books. But it is known that they are depictions of ballets, and so I just thought I'd spatialize them. You know. um, but of course I'm not doing it like a proper you know, historian. None, no. none of this is actually proper. Well, well, it's proper in that you're kind of using your hand to kind of understand, like, to rebuild, yeah. right? So you're rebuilding. Sure. Like, and, it's uh, and, it's, and it's, you know, it's playful. It's, a, it's, I yeah. it's an idea about stuff. I mean, it's not as if you'd get any closer if you were an actual historian, you know. Yeah, exactly. And then, so, I guess, in the, in the title, Studies of, early, of Scenography, you're kind of, it's, it's also a kind of process of learning. Right, um, if, and and you know, in your work, you you draw, you paint, but you also produce performances. So, how does this, how does making that artwork kind of influence sort of other aspects of your practice? Mm. Uh, it's it's all it all goes simultaneous. Right, it all goes simultaneously. I mean, like for example, when I'm uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm making a drawing of some nail clippers at the moment. Um, and the hand that is having its nail clipped is like the hand of um, Adam as created by God and the hand <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. I mean in a way it's, it's drawn obviously worse than the Michelangelo but um, the, but like the pose is similar and the reason why that is there also is because oh, someone at the door yeah. Come join. somebody Come join. at the door yeah. <laughs> what is that from rent I don't know what um, but the the um, but th but the reason why this hand is in this style is because that 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 style of posing mm -hmm. is a style that is related to this kind of balletic expressatura that I was very keen on in performances that were then used in the Mannerist painting. So it's a way of performing contrapposto in everyday life and that it was sort of continuously in use from the late 15th century all the way up until, you know, RuPaul's Drag Race, you know. Yeah. And is it also a reference to think contemporary things like Ru RuPaul's Drag Race then? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's how to try to quantify homosexual mannerism. Yeah. You know, it's how to, how to explain why I do this, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Um, next slide, please. Uh, five more minutes. Yeah, okay, we're going to have to rattle through. So, um, this is one of your really brilliant books, but maybe we'll, we'll go past it. Um, uh, 
Yes, so I wanted to talk a little bit about your writing practice. So you, you write beautifully uh, <laughs> and you write a lot in, um, for, your, for your books, as I mentioned earlier. And I guess um, what that process is, are you writing whilst you're making your drawings, whilst you're thinking about you know, what they're communicating? Is it always a story? Or, I mean, because your writing, in a way, is, is very personal rather than academic. I mean, H Helen at Heyday. You, yeah. you write very personally sure. up there, so yeah, yeah you could just talk talk a bit about that. Uh, about my writing style. Yeah, and yeah, I guess yeah, your writing style and, and how it, what that process in, in relation to the drawings and how you make the drawings. You yeah. know, is it is it a written piece that you then make the drawings to match or? I mean, uh, it, I, generally the the writing comes afterwards, but mm. I, I think that there is this. I mean, I, I grew up on Blackadder, you know, and, um, and French and Saunders and, and these sorts of programmes. And these programmes and, you know, children's things like rent these programmes all use this kind of 70s and 80s hyperbole style. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everything is completely pushed to this kind of exaggeration. Um, and... I, I kind of use that in language in my drawings also. It's a sort of, um, I mean, I'm sort of thinking on my feet a bit, but um, it, it's, it's a way of showing, some, sometimes showing the opposite mm. um, uh, by over-praising, by over-exaggerating, by, you know, by making an extraordinary claim to something. But it is uh, ultimately a form of irony um, or a, a form of allegory, you know, and these things are things that are related to um, having to live and behave internally and externally in different ways. So they are connected to homosexuality. They're yeah. connected to being gay and having to pretend you are not, yeah. having to hide effeminate behavior, for example. So all of these things create the awareness that your masculinity is a performance or that your physical behavior is something that you are having to psychologically control um, and that it, it will affect how other people perceive you. Um, and these things ultimately um, uh, create a fracture which in art historical terms is really interesting. These fractures are really interesting. I mean, gay rights is crucial, you know, mm. uh, and, um, and it is extremely important that kids are not beaten up in the play playground because they're a bit camp, you mm. know, or because they are trans. Um, but um, the um, art that was being created during times by queer people, during times of oppression, mm -hmm. was really bloody interesting. It had a real charge. And we can see in things like RuPaul's Drag Race mm -hmm. how that mainstreamization weakens the impulse. Yeah, I'm really, really glad you touched now upon, um, and maybe if we go to the next slide, um, really great book, everybody should check it out. But next, um, I really wanted to have enough time to, so just the next slide, please, um, talk about the book, Helen, it's heyday. Uh, and the exhibition's on until till the second, but I think what's really brilliant about this um, catalogue and the exhibition is you, um, yeah, you start to really, I mean, not start, you kind of continue the conversation around power structures in architecture and or power structures in our built environment mm -hmm. and um, how they manifest themselves visually. Um, so I thought, I wondered if you could talk about the kind of title um, well, uh, page uh, image uh, botanical gardens and what you're trying to do here and I've <laughs> put the uh, model of the Albert Speer, um building next to it for yeah. well I mean the, the kind of the, the scene sort of I mean in a way it sort of kind of emblemizes my childhood it's a bit mm. of an al allegory but in in a in a Rubens type way I mean it, it, it's th there's there's very complicated image building. This means this, and this means that, and this means that, and this means that, and they relate to the da, da, da. But ultimately, the allegory might be really dumb, you mm. know. 
wasn't the Duke of Alba really great, you know, mm. or, um, or uh, the triumph of chastity over love, or whatever, you know, the, the actual content, you know, the, the deep meaning might be pretty simple. Mm. Um, and that's sort of what's going on in this picture, that there's a lot of little bits and pieces that, that kind of build up a, an image which, for me, evokes something of uh, the dictatorship in Argentina when I was a small boy, mm. um, a kind of a, uh, an, an oppressive patriarchy, um, growing up gay, you know, lots of different bits and pieces like that, um, things that evoke this and that for me, but it's kind of gelled and condensed down into a, a kind of, you know, a fantasy scene, really. Yeah, I mean, it's also something about the kind of the moment and how, you know, the importance of contextualizing architecture within, you know, the, the context of, of things, you know, you talked about imperialism, col colonialism, um, industrialization, and how, of course, I mean, maybe if we go to the next slide, um, just to end on, um, see the, the kind of interior of the exhibition, of course, you know, how sort of in one way you're saying, you know, these things are brilliant, and of course, progress is, is revered, but that it's it's also led to a lot of horror and um, most um, notably the climate crisis now. But 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 I think for me, really important to kind of talk about these things in their context and not just say, okay, you know, uh, Corinthian columns are, are beautiful and let's just keep using them forever, but really to kind of contextualize that um, they're <laughs> they have a sort of horror tied to them as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 yes, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a classicist. There's, yeah. there's no sort of intrinsic, you know, transcendental value to this curlicue over mm. that curlicue. I mean, it's mm. idiotic to think there is, really. But, um, <laughs> but the, the, what I think really, I mean, for me, the show was about, as you said before, was this, um, it was this sense um, that, um, the, the sort of uh, the parameters of progress or goals set by a particular period or a particular group of people um, are going to be judged harshly no matter mm -hmm. what by the future generations yeah okay I think probably that's our time Alice, thank you um, and um, thank you for yeah joining me um, yeah everybody should go see the exhibition of course yeah <laughs>